Welcome to part two of the module on concurrent and network software design. In part one of this module, we talked about communication design dimensions and explored the pros and cons of various ways of allowing apps and services to interact across processes via communication. In this part of the module, we're going to be presenting key service, server, and configuration design dimensions, which will focus on evaluating the pros and cons of alternative designs that apps can use in order to organize their structure and their configuration. Once again, this material is covered in more detail at the URL at the bottom of the slides. So let's first talk about some definitions. When designing concurrent and networked apps, it's important to differentiate between several different entities services, servers, and configurations. A service is essentially a capability offered to clients. Things like web content retrieval, software distribution, electronic mail transfer, file access to remote machines, network time synchronization, streaming audio video, and so on. We're not using service in the narrow sense of a web service, something that has a web service definition language interface description implemented using XML, RPC, and so on. We're using the term more broadly. These services could be implemented by functions, objects, components, or web services for that matter. A server is the mechanism by which the service is offered and delivered to the client. It provides the units of resource allocation, protection, and computation in order to carry out the work. Finally, a configuration binds services together in various structural arrangements at various points in time. Of course, these services run in the context of servers in the configurations they've been assembled into. So let's talk about a couple of different types of services. One type of service is a short duration versus a long duration service. A short duration service executes for a brief, relatively fixed amount of time and may handle one request at a time. Some examples of short duration services include things like returning the current time of day from a time service, resolving the ethernet number, from an IP address, or retrieving a disk block from a cache of a network file server. To minimize the time spent setting up a connection, short duration services sometimes are implemented using connectionless protocols, things like UDP IP. Long duration services, in contrast, typically run for extended, often variable amounts of time, and they can handle numerous requests during their lifetime. Some examples of long duration services include things like downloading software releases via secure uh, FTP or HTTP, streaming audio video from a server using the real time streaming protocol, performing a remote file system backup over a network and so on. Long duration services are often implemented using connection oriented protocols because the time spent initiating them is insignificant relative to the amount of time spent delivering the content and reliability is often important. So TCP IP is a common choice for long duration services. Another set of design dimensions in this space relate to internal versus external services. An internal service executes in the same address space as the server that receives the request from the client. The benefits of doing things this way are that communication and synchronization between the internal services running in some dispatcher process can be very efficient and low latency because you're typically running in the same address space. The downside, of course, is if services decide to go rogue, if they have an infinite loop or they corrupt parts of the memory, then in some languages, this can cause problems for other co-located services by corrupting their state and interfering with their processing or timing properties. An alternative approach is to implement so-called external services. In this model, the service runs in a different address space from the dispatcher that received the request. The benefit here, of course, is isolation, separation of concerns. If something goes wrong in one external service, it will be protected from another service that may be executing simultaneously in a different process. The downside is if the services have to interact with each other, then the inter-process communication and synchronization overhead will be higher. Another related set of service dimensions involve monolithic versus layered and modular services. A monolithic service clumps together a bunch of functionality and doesn't organize the functionality in any hierarchical way. 
The benefit with this approach is you may end up with greater efficiency because you can communicate by making method calls or other forms of communication through global data. The downside is that by tightly coupling services together in a monolithic structure, they often become much more difficult to understand, evolve, and maintain. In contrast, layered and monolithic services are decomposed into partitioned, often hierarchically related tasks and work. This typically makes them easier to understand, evolve, and maintain because there's greater separation of concerns, greater isolation of dependencies, the kinds of things we talked about earlier in this section in the context of the layer pattern, for example. The downside, of course, is if you start having high, highly layered or highly modular implementations and service configurations, and you don't think through some of the efficiency issues, they can incur a fair amount of overhead to move things between layers. Uh, for example, if you're foolish enough to implement each layer as a process or perhaps a thread, you may end up incurring too much context switching and synchronization overhead relative to the benefits you get by using a modular and layered approach. Another design dimension in this space has to do with single service versus multi-service servers. A single server, single service server only offers one service to the outside world, which could be an internally implemented service or an externally implemented service. The benefits here, of course, are separation of concerns and isolation of behavior. You only think about each service doing one thing. The downsides are the potential for excessive operating system resources because each server well, each service will run in its own server, potentially, a lot of redundant code that isn't necessarily easily shared, and the need to be able to manually stop and restart the services and administer them in various ad hoc and inconsistent ways. An alternative approach, which is popularized by the INET-D Unix super server, is to have a multi-service server. The idea here is that you integrate multiple services together into this super server-like structure, which then accepts the connection requests, perhaps reads data, and then spawns the various services to do the work. Some things can run internally, some may run externally. The pros here, of course, are there's greater amounts of sharing, perhaps a single way of administering things. You may have a way to automate starting and stopping of services and updating the services that are provided and so on. The downside is that you may end up having to fit your services into a Procrustean bed of one size fits all configuration, which could be excessively constraining for certain services. Another de design dimension are one-shot versus standing servers. A one-shot server is spawned on demand and performs service requests in a separate thread or process, and it typically terminates itself after the particular request or session is done. The benefit with this is you only use resources like memory, processors, CPUs and so on, and processes for the amount of time that they're actually active. The downside is there's some additional overhead to start up the, the one-shot server every time there's work for it to do. The alternative approach is called a standing server. This, in this model, the server process or thread continues to run beyond the lifetime of the service request that triggered its launching. Uh, typically, these would be initiated at boot time by a super server uh, or a startup script, or perhaps by a super server when it receives the first request from a client, and then it remains running for some period of time afterwards. The benefit here is that you can amortize the startup cost, the startup latency. The downside is you may end up with higher resource utilization if the standing servers aren't busy much of the time. And yet another configuration dimension in this space has to do with static versus dynamic linking and configuration. In a static the configured system, the objects or functions or components, services, whatever they're called, are brought together typically at static compile and link time. The benefit here is that you end up having greater uh, runtime performance because you can do certain optimizations using static linking with inlining and other kinds of ways of optimizing the placement of the code. Uh, the downside is that you have less flexibility. You need to typically stop a running server and restart it, recompile it, relink it, and so on, if you want to make any changes to the way in which things work. And that can become overly inflexible and constraining in some environments that can't afford any downtime. An alternative approach is to use dynamic configuration. In this case, you're able to load and unload these object files 
at runtime, either when the system starts or even while the system is up and running, if you're careful about the protocols that you implement to make sure that the updates or the upgrades are done safely and uh, consistently. The benefit with this is you can reduce memory utilization because you can only be linking in the services that you're actually using. And you can also increase flexibility because you can bring services in on demand in a very fine-grained way depending on the context and the external conditions in which they're running. The downside, of course, is that there's typically more overhead when you use dynamic linking and dynamic configuration. Certain operations take a little longer. Certain optimizations are a bit more difficult to do at uh, compile time and link time. Uh, and there's also, of course, the issue of security risks. When you start linking in code dynamically, there's always the potential for Trojan horses, where people slip in other dynamic link libraries or shared object files, and you may not necessarily get the behavior you want. And of course, there's also the age-old problem of linking things together that worked when run in isolation statically, but when composed together, have various conflicts and other hazards that don't manifest themselves till runtime. And that may degrade the, the quality of service or the reliability of the solution as well. There's a paper at my website that talks a bit more about these different configuration approaches between static and dynamic configuration and talks about some patterns and frameworks to make them work more effectively. So to summarize this part of the module, we covered several different groups of design decisions, design dimensions, that are related to developing and deploying networked applications. We talked about these service and server design dimensions, which affect the way in which applications and services are structured developed and instantiated. And we also talked about service configuration, which are design dimensions that relate to how you change the system configuration and placement and binding of various services together in various servers very late in the design cycle, uh, in the life cycle, at runtime or at installation time. These topics are described and evaluated in more detail in some of the chapters of the C++ Network Programming Volume 2 book. And I recommend you take a look there for additional discussion and coverage of this type of information and these design decisions. As you might imagine, there's quite a number of patterns lurking in this space. We talked about a few of them briefly. We'll cover many more of these patterns in later parts of the course.